super excited that you all are here. Only one time I've ever preached to an empty congregation. So um, I remember it was, oh man, probably six or seven years ago, I was at my father-in-law's church. My father-in-law is a pastor, and uh, they support our family uh, as one of their missionaries. And uh, they had such a bad storm near Philadelphia that they canceled church. But he's like, we can live stream it, so just go on in there. And so my father-in-law sat there, and there was a video guy in the back, and that was weird. Okay, it's weird preaching to a video camera, um, but uh, super excited uh, just to be here with you this morning. Um, let's open with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get into it. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that we can be here together. Lord, I thank you for your word, and that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can pierce to the center of our hearts. And Lord, that is painful when it does that, but Lord, it also is rewarding because it points out the things that uh, need to go, points out the areas where we need to grow and become more like you. And I just thank you for your word that it is living. And uh, Lord, I just thank you that you don't give up on us, that you continue to work in us and to change us and to grow us to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for your help as we come to your word. I pray that our focus would be on the truths of Scripture. Our hearts would be open to the promptings of the still, small voice of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that the things that I share would be accurate to your word as well. So we ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. When you hear the word change, what comes to mind? Is that a good feeling that comes to mind? Is that a bad feeling that comes to mind? I don't know, it depends, right? Some changes are good, some changes are like, uh. When it comes to a Baptist church, when you say change, that's bad, always bad, okay. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding, sort of. Um, but uh, anyways, but I, you know, okay, so here's another question. Um, when you look back across your life, so not talking about salvation, what is one of the events that had the greatest change in your life made the greatest change and I, I was thinking about that so maybe you have an answer and I was thinking back and I was like marriage yeah that's a really big change in someone's life and some of you I know that was a very very long time ago okay um, but you're like I just don't remember not being married okay uh, but you think about the change when someone gets married Okay, so before marriage, you're single. That means you can kind of make your own decisions. I got married when I was 28. i uh, been on my own for a while. And so, I mean, if you want to stay up late, you can stay up late. If you want to get in the car and go for a ride, you can do that. If you want, I mean, you do whatever, whatever you want to do. And then you meet that special someone. And you're like, whoa, this is the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And... You get married, and it's an awesome wedding day, an awesome honeymoon, and then you kind of settle into life, and you're like, oh, there's things like insurance, and there's things like, you know, I, I mean, I could go on a trip, and I just sleep in the van. Well, you, you don't do that once you get married, usually. Um, uh, there's housing, there's responsibility, there's, uh, you know, what do you want to watch tonight? Well, I actually have to ask that question. I don't have to, you know, before... It was whatever I wanted to watch, whatever I wanted to do, wherever I wanted to go. And then there was two of us. And you have to figure out how two, that have now become one flesh before the Lord, how we two will live together and make decisions together. And then, you know, a couple years in, you're starting to make decisions and you're like, hmm, your family was very different than my family when it comes to some of these things. How do we put some of these, uh, these backgrounds together? But it's okay. You're married and it's awesome. But then another change often comes along in that road of life, right? Down the road of life. And that's children. And I think children is even more of a change than marriage, at least for us. Why? You're not flexible anymore, okay? Infants, as CJ uh, and family are discovering, infants are very needy, okay? They need sleep, they need food, there's schedules to follow. 
flexibility changes. If you're going on a trip with a small child, like you take the, what the GPS says and you chuck it out the door because you're not going to get there anywhere close to that six hours. It's going to be eight or nine or maybe ten, okay? And, uh, you know, children change a lot of things. Now, they're worth it. We love our kids, but life changes. And uh, when we think of the Christian life and we think of change, what's the biggest change in a Christian's life? Well, I think usually we would say, well, it's the gospel. It's the point in my life when I understood that I was a sinner. I understood there was nothing I could do about my sin. I understood that Jesus did it all when he died on the cross to pay the punishment for my sin. And that point where I understood that and I accepted his gift of forgiveness, I was saved. And you look back on your life, like, that's when my life changed. But I think sometimes when we think of the word the gospel, the gospel equals salvation. And that's it. And the gospel is that one point in my life when I trusted Christ as Savior and I was adopted into his family. I was forgiven of my sin, and that's the gospel. But the gospel is a little bit like that illustration of marriage. The gospel doesn't just have that one-time impact in our lives. It's a one-time event that has continuing impact forever. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Um, I was going to talk about three things that the gospel changes, but as I uh, kept working on this, I think we're just going to go with the first one for sake of time, okay? So my wife, I kept telling my wife, I thought I was done, but then I wasn't. And so be thankful I shortened five pages down to two and a half, and we're still on point one. So maybe I'll get another chance here uh, in a couple of weeks or in a month, and uh, we can look at some of the other things that the gospel changes. But, um, so let's look at one thing that one of the major changes that the gospel makes in our lives. When you, hear, when you hear the word righteous, what picture comes to your mind? I was thinking about that. We don't, like, in normal everyday life, we don't usually use the word righteous, okay? Oh, you know that guy? Yeah, he's a righteous guy. I've never had someone tell me that. Uh, when describing someone else. Uh, so usually, we hear the term righteous when we're in church or when we're reading our Bible. But if, if, we, if you, someone was to be described as righteous, how would you describe that in different words? We're like, well, they're a really good person. Maybe they are very moral and upright and trustworthy. How would you define someone who is the opposite of righteous? Sinful? wicked? In the time of Christ, who was perceived as righteous? There were some people that everyone thought were righteous. It was the Pharisees, right? And, but were they actually righteous? Yeah, but, in, but truly righteous. No, they weren't. They were righteous in their own eyes because they thought if they did all these things, that made them acceptable to God. Turn to, we're going to be in several different passages this morning. The first one is in Romans chapter 10. And this, Paul, this is Paul writing to the believers in Rome. And this shows his burden for the children of Israel, for the Israelites. And he uses the term righteousness in this passage. Uh, Romans 10, starting in verse 1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, uh, in context, for Israel, is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They didn't know the gospel. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. These people are establishing their own version of righteousness. But that's not God's righteousness. The reality 
and miracle of the gospel is not only did Jesus become sin for us, but at the same point we trusted Christ as our Savior, we became the righteousness of God. And we're going to jump down to 2 uh, Corinthians as we look at the passage that that comes from. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Second Corinthians five seventeen it says this. Therefore, this is the passage that we read earlier. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you jump down to verse uh, 21, it says, For our sake, he, talking about God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin who knew no sin. Why did he do that? It started with for our sake. So God the Father made the Lord Jesus Christ to become sin for us, for our sake. Jesus knew no sin. He was not sinful. He was perfect. So that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. The miracle of the gospel is that not only did Jesus become sin for us, but at the point we trusted Christ, we became the righteousness of God. Like, that's kind of a weird way to put it. Well, that's what it says right there. It says, we became the righteousness of God. Jesus, the perfect righteous son of God, became my sin, and I became righteous. There was a trade. And it's not just man's righteousness. It says it's the righteousness of God. So here's a question. How righteous is God? Uh, how do you answer that question, okay? Perfectly righteous, right? Zero sin, zero blemish, zero imperfection. God is the, I mean, he is righteous. That's who he is. And that is the righteousness that Christ applied to my account and your account at salvation. Okay? My sin debt, your sin debt was paid in full and now our record is impeccable. Why? Because we're so amazing? No, because God has taken Christ's righteousness and put it on our account. When he looks at your record and my record, it's spotless. It's spotless. It's from, but it, it's all because of Jesus. It's, it's just, I mean, that's just something we need to sit on. Because we know our struggle with sin. We know how often we choose to disobey. We know how often we choose, we're just talking about the fruits of the Spirit and choosing the opposite <laughs> of that in men's Sunday school. We know how often we don't love. We know how often we are unkind. We know how often we're not patient. Yet when God looks at John and all of his sinfulness, he doesn't see that. He sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. So the one thing that the gospel changes that we're looking at this morning is that the gospel changes our standing before God. It changes our standing. We have Christ's righteousness. I mean, we could just pray and do communion and leave right there. I mean, wow, that's amazing. Because of the gospel, we who were dead now have abundant life. We who were worthy of death have perfection written in our account. But Paul keeps going. Look down in chapter 6, the next verse, verse 1. He says, Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So Paul's pleading with the Corinthian believers not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, what, is, what does that mean? How can you receive the grace of God in vain? The grace of God, he's talking about the gospel. His passage, he's talking about the gospel. And so, the grace of God specifically, how can we receive the gospel in vain? And uh, if you were to go down a couple uh, chapters, um, as Paul keeps talking through all of this, um, one of the ways that we can receive the gospel in vain is by, um, let's see if I can find, find it off. Cannot 
it's not coming right off the top, but it's um, being unequally yoked with unbelievers. It's actually in context, as you follow through what Paul is going about to share, he talks about not being unequally yoked with, with, with unbelievers. And uh, so obviously that's marriage. <laughs> a believer should not marry an unbeliever. Um, but that's, I think there's a lot of practical applications in that. But I think another way that we can receive the, the gospel in vain is by resisting the process of sanctification that the Lord wants to work in our lives. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And he didn't save us to just say, the gospel, this date, this person trusted Christ, they now have Christ's righteousness, they're my child, they have a home in heaven, and then they just have to try to live a good life after that. That's, that's not why he saved us. And in Galatians, I'm going to jump into Galatians here, Galatians 3, uh, starting in verse 1, Paul, as he's writing to the believers in Galatia, he says this, he says, O foolish Galatians, now these are believers, okay? O foolish Galatians, <laughs> no one likes to be called foolish, right? Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing with faith? How, how were you saved? Were you saved by keeping the law or by hearing the gospel and in faith trusting in what Christ did for you? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul, Paul he doesn't uh, cut any corners. He just, like, he just says it as it is. And uh, I kind of like that, and when it, then when it applies to me, I don't like that. Um, but, he, like, you trusted Christ in faith by the Holy Spirit how are you supposed to live? Do you think that you are going to be able to live a life that pleases God in your own strength? So did, th did these believers, were they saved because they kept the Old Testament law? No, right? There's no way they could have kept the Old Testament law. Are we saved because we keep the Old Testament law? No. There's, there's no way. How did they become recipients of the gospel? By faith in Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that what? Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's nothing I can do. It's not of my works. It's the gift of God by grace through faith. We're not saved by the things we do, but by what Christ has done. He did it all. There's no way we could live to God's level of perfection, but Jesus did it for you and for me. So the Galatians, they'd been saved by faith alone. That's what Paul says. They know that. But as they're striving to live the Christian life, they're going back to a list of the rules from the Old Testament law in order to maintain their righteousness. Does that make sense? So, God saved me by grace through faith. But now, in order for me to be righteous, I have to go back and follow all these rules. And if I do all these things perfectly, then I have a righteous life. And really, I think the picture, um, something that might picture this, is picture a slave being freed from bondage to an evil, cruel master. Okay? It's a terrible situation. He's freed from his bondage. And not only is that, but his benefactor, the person who frees him, adopts him as his own child. But then, this person who is formerly a slave, who has, you know, wh whatever paper signed or whatever, that he is a free person, voluntarily puts himself back into bondage under that master. Like, what, what are you thinking? In the next several chapters of Galatians, Paul talks about all of that. He says, you were under the law. 
you were under the law. You were trying to do all these things. There's no way you could do it. Jesus is the only one that could do it. Why are you going back to the law to gain acceptance from God? You think about what happens at salvation. Not only do we have the perfect righteousness of God, but what else happens? Who comes to indwell us? The Holy Spirit. God, Jesus sent a comforter to indwell us. And I know it's sometimes hard to understand because he's a spirit, right? But we've probably all been there where we've done something, we've said something, and the Holy Spirit pricks us and says, hey, <laughs> you were impatient. That wasn't kind. You really blew it right there. That was not showing the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us at the point of salvation, and he stays with us. He comforts us, and on top of that, he enables us to live a life that's not under the bondage of law, but a life that is directed by love for God and for others. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says this. It says, But I say, walk, another word for that is live, okay? Walk by the Spirit, this idea of our lifestyle. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And I think this is where it can get confusing. It can get, um, the actions can be the same. But what am I trying to accomplish by my actions? Because are we, as, as God's children, are we supposed to live for God? Yes. Are we supposed to do right? Yes. I mean, what does Paul say? He says, um, should, should we live in sin because grace abounds? I mean, God's grace covers it, right? So I can do whatever. Like, no, God forbid. So I want to live a life that pleases God, but it's the motivation behind why I do what I do. If I think that God will accept me because I keep all these rules and that makes me godly, I'm approaching it from the wrong viewpoint. Does that make sense? But rather, if I walk in the Spirit, and I can be doing almost all those same things, but my motivation is, God, I want to honor you. God, I want to obey you. God, I want to love you. Then it's all praise to God. It's not the law, it's not the rules that I'm striving to keep. It's the Savior that I'm striving to love, honor, and obey. That, it's the motivation behind why we do what we do. Have you ever heard or used the phrase, nobody's perfect? Okay, why do we say that? Why do we say that? Um, I think it's to let ourselves off the hook from living up to an expectation, okay? So, um, you know, and I think that's okay in some instances. I think that's okay when I accidentally knocked over the pitcher of lemonade or put the car in the ditch, right? And, like, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have accidents. And it's like, nobody's perfect. And it's like, yes. But I think when we say nobody's perfect in relation to the Christian life, what is our motive in saying that? Like, what's the motivation behind sticking that phrase out there? I think it's similar. I think it's to let ourselves off the hook of living in obedience to the Lord. I mean, really, like, when you think about that, and I just thought about this last night, and I was like, oh, wow. Because it's, it's really easy to say, well, nobody's perfect, so therefore, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? If we were to rephrase it, we could say, everyone's sinful, so don't feel bad about it. It's like, we would never say that, right? Um, but as we come to striving to live a life that pleases God, like, we all have to fight against the desires of the flesh. Paul tells us, it's going to be a battle. There is spiritual warf warfare going on. It's not easy. But our attitude should not be, we can't be perfect. So don't feel bad about it. Actually, we, remember where we started? We are perfect. 
we have perfection. We are righteous. Positionally, from God's perspective, every believer has a perfect record applied to our account. Perfection has already been obtained for me. It was Christ's perfection. It wasn't my own. But as I live this life, I know that I have the flesh that I struggle with. I know that I have the sin nature that I struggle with. But at that point of salvation, the Holy Spirit came to indwell me, and he does give me the power to obey. He does give me the power to do right. We do know from Scripture that the just man falls seven times and rises up again. So we know that we're not going to live a life that is without sin. But a just man doesn't stay in his sin. He does get up, and he keeps going. He does get up, and he makes that right with that brother or that sister or his spouse or his kids and says, I shouldn't have said that. I got angry. That was sin. Will you forgive me? And he makes those things right, and he gets up and keeps going. So what does God intend for us in the Christian life? The Christian life is intended to be one of obedience and victory. But I'm not obeying a list of rules. I'm obeying motivated out of love for my Savior and enabled by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's the motivation. And obviously, we want to read God's word. We're going to strive to obey, but not so he accepts us, but because we love him. He's already accepted us based upon what Jesus has done for us. Philippians 1.6 says this. It says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. He that started it. Jesus started it. He started it the day that he allowed me to understand the gospel. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And we know that one day we will be perfect without a sin nature when we get to heaven. And until then, our goal is to strive to faithfully serve and obey our Savior. As we go into this week, remember the power of Christ that saved us from slavery to our sin is the same power that enables us to live a life that is pleasing to God. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we come before you and we thank you that it is not our power. It is your power through your spirit. It's only by that that we can obey. Lord, even as we think about Galatians 5 and the fruit of the spirit, all of those things, love, joy, peace, all of that whole list Lord, we cannot manufacture that (laughs) in our own flesh. That is a result of the fruit of the Spirit at work in our lives and us just living in obedience to him. Lord, I pray that as we go into this week that we truly would live a victorious Christian life. Lord, I know that we may choose to disobey, we may choose to sin, but Lord, help us to recognize that, call it what it is, confess it to you, make it right with other people, and get back up and faithfully serve you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.